Hi, my name is Mike Berry. I uh, work in the platform engineering team at ANZ. So we look after a lot of what you might call DevOps things, so we're continuous integration pipelines, continuous delivery. Uh, right now we're doing a lot of work with Kubernetes and containers and those kinds of things. And so we really like the DevOps um, talks conference. Uh, one of the main reasons is because you get a good combination of kind of really interesting new technologies and so talking about AI and serverless and some of those interesting things that are coming, but also some very practical suggestions on how to go through a DevOps transformation and how to look after tools and what are some good suggestions on how other people have done um, these kinds of transformations and, and setups in the past. And so we've been here uh, last year, we're here again and I'm sure we'll be here next year. Um, and we've brought quite a few of the team along so they can kind of experience the same things. It's really useful to meet people and also afterwards we go away and we talk a lot about what we've learned and how we think we can apply it in our workplace. So uh, it's been great and we look forward to coming back. Good morning everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here. This is my first DevOps Talks. Um, who here has heard of Google? Who's, here, uh, who's heard of SRE? Okay, have you read the SRE book? All right, cool. Uh, so then you don't need to hear this. Um, for the rest of you, site reliability engineering is uh, a group that started in about 2003 when Google was just Google.com and the job was to keep the site up at any cost because even back then, if Google.com went down, then that was big news and we didn't want that to happen. Um, even today though, we have many more products and the site reliability part, the site word doesn't really mean site so much as systems or services. And so we have lots of products like Gmail and storage and uh, apps, um, G Suite and, and so on and so forth. And so all these SRE teams are now butted off from the original team and manage each of these little services in, independently. Um, but in the title of the job, there's also this word reliability and why is that there? Well, it's because it's the number one feature that you have in any product online. And I'm gonna tell you why. So, in Gmail circa 2016, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do. You can send emails, you can chat to people, you can reply to emails. Sorry, I already said that. Um, you can read them. Um, you can filter them, you can search on them, you can do all this cool stuff. But what if we take those features away? If you really like Gmail and we take some of those features away, you might get a little bit unhappy, right? So maybe replying to emails is the number one feature that Gmail has or maybe chatting to people using Hangouts is the number one feature. But what about Gmail 500? The total absence of any feature of Gmail means you can't use Gmail at all. So how do you balance having the system there at all, the product available, against any other feature? And the answer is you can't, because without a product, you don't have any users. But reliability is very easy to take for granted, because most of the time it's there, it's like oxygen. You only really notice it when it starts to go away. But by the time a system becomes unstable, especially a system like Gmail, where there are so many moving parts that uh, it takes a lot of failures for a um, catastrophic failure to occur. And accident theory tells us that uh, any large outage is caused by a whole lot of confounding events at the same time. So if Gmail goes down, how many problems do you think we have to solve to get it back up again? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a lot. But we don't have any time to do that at that point. So what we have to do is plan ahead and assign time to work on reliability before any of the systems fails. And so that's what we do. So our team uh, solves production problems using software. We're a software engineering team. We look at a large scale, but the idea is that we don't try to scale the humans with the rest of the service. We try and keep us growing sublinearly in relation to the size of the, uh, the service, say, how many CPUs it costs to run, or the number of users using the product. The, uh, the number of people maintaining the product has to stay relatively low. And then we balance competing demands, like how more efficient do we make it, or like can we make it more reliable, or the cost of efficiency. Um, how do we uh, onboard new services to a particular team so that they're doing more with fewer people, and so on and so forth. So we care a lot about site is there. We care that it doesn't cost too much to run. We also care that it's fast enough that people really want to use the product so that they show back up again and that kind of feeds back into them wanting it to be there so we have to make sure it's there. But we also care a lot that the system can be maintained by ourselves and this goes back to the idea that we don't have so many people managing the system because we write tools and automation to replace ourselves 
and make the system maintainable as it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, on-call responsibilities, we do as a function of reliability and not for the sake of being on-call at all. I'd much rather not be on-call, but it turns out that my human brain is pretty good at pattern matching that computers can't do. And so there's a trade-off between making systems reliable and also being able to fix it when it doesn't seem so reliable that we haven't yet been able to automate. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, so we're not a product development team. We're a reliability team, but so there's another group of people who are dedicated to the feature development. Uh, we, we've separated the organization from the development team, even though it's the number one priority, because if it's, that priority is blended in with all the other feature priorities, naturally an organization will say, oh, we can sacrifice reliability work because we need to get this feature launched. And the idea is we don't want to do that, so we dedicate a whole role to the purpose of maintaining reliability and speaking up for it and ensuring that the product has people making sure that it stays up all the time. And so we do design reviews. We have amassed a large body of experience through past launches and failures, and we want people to learn from those mistakes and learn the patterns that did work. And so we try and say, hey, that pattern doesn't work so well. We've seen it fail like this, or that's a very good pattern. You should um, definitely go ahead with that one. Um, and so we generate a lot of artifacts, like best practices documents and so forth, and build automation, and we build libraries and frameworks so that people don't have to really think about it too hard. So if you need to build, say, load shedding into your service, there's already a library that does that. You just say, I'd like to use the load shedding API, please. And so now, if my server becomes overloaded, it can automatically just discard requests and hand them back upstream. And so our goals are making sure the users are benefited, that the uh, side effects of reliability and efficiency and the manageability of the system as it improves over time. We are programmers, so we use exactly the same things that the programmers do. We use unit tests, we use integration tests, we use continuous delivery systems, we package software, we deploy it in production exactly the same way. We have debuggers, we have um, code review tools. Um, everything is code, it's uh, infrastructure is code. So everything that we do is exactly the same as everything a software engineer does which means we're like actually the same people, we just have a different focus. The reliability organization, um, in order to have that voice for reliability in every product, the organization goes up to the senior vice president level inside Google, and within that organization, we break up based on product alignment. So, as I said before, we have the SRE teams dedicated to Gmail, to maps, to storage, and so on and so forth. Within those groups, the SRE and the development, the product development org co-own the product, and so as a team, you can either choose to add more SRE work to make the product more reliable, or not. Now, SREs are in short supply. There's about a, um, I think like a one to 30 ratio at best in the company of SREs to the rest of engineering, which means there's um, a strong demand for SREs to be on a service, which means lots of services don't have them. So ultimately, many things at Google have development teams running production for their own systems. And it's only the very high value products that get SRE support out of necessity. The budget for staffing SREs, though, comes from the product itself. So there's no split headcount for the SRE org or the, um, the product team. The product team owns all the headcount, and they can assign uh, a new engineer to the SRE org or, um, or to the development team as they decide. The only difference really then is that we're not typically doing feature development, we're not doing front-end related development. Uh, I'm not so sure about the greater choice aspect, but let's just go with that one. SRE kind of sounds like a traditional operations organization, and I want to uh, talk a bit about that. Let's say that there's this, uh, the internal, the eternal conflict of development and operations is that dev wants to ship features and operations doesn't want them to because it um, affects the stability of the system. The development team is incented to ship features because that's how they, um, they make money for the company and the operations team is incented to make the system stable and those two things are at odds with each other. So how do we prevent that? Like we can have launch checklists. We have the operations team gradually building this corpus of information about things that have gone wrong in the past from the past launches that each of us have experienced ourselves, our friends in another team have experienced. So we can add these things to a pre-launch checklist and we can start saying, okay, releases have to happen. We understand that. but. The way we're going to manage it is by making sure that you've ticked all the boxes on this checklist before we go ahead, and that seems like a good idea. Uh, so gradually this list accumulates all of the scar tissue that every individual has ever seen from my experience here at this company, the experiences of the last company, I read an article about some other company having an outage last week, and that's given me some ideas about things we should check for, 
And sooner or later, you have a checklist that costs more to the company than the product development itself. And so obviously we don't want that. So what the development team does is it skirts around the checklist and says, oh, this isn't actually a launch, this is an experiment, or this is a flag flip, or this is just uh, a feature change, and we're just gonna kind of slide it in there in the regular release process, and so it doesn't look like we're launching anything anymore, we've just kind of twiddled the terminology a little bit, and that's fine. But now the operations team doesn't actually know anything about what's going on, and so when they get paged for it, they, uh, just going, I don't know, this, everything's broken, nobody's telling me what's happening. And so they are the ones most incented to object to anything happening because they don't know anything that's going on, right? And so I posit to you, is conflict inevitable? And I think that's a silly question to ask an audience of DevOps because you all know the answer already. The way we solve it is we don't do any of that stuff. And you might ask, how is it possible that any Google product is up at all? So we've come up with this idea of an error budget. This is a way we can say a failure is gonna happen. We would like some failure to continue to happen. Um, we can use that to our advantage and say, if you start to burn errors, that's a great signal for us, but it also means we get a lot of velocity when things are going really well. Uh, we need a, an objective though, in order to measure our error budget. Excuse me. All right, so an SLI, a service level indicator is uh, a measurement. We are measuring latency, we're measuring the number of errors. And that's all it is. We're just saying there is a signal that tells us something is happening. We've got a tape measure out, we've measured how long the thing is. The objective is something that we want it to be, right? A threshold. So if we want to say that the error rate should be less than 1%, now we've got an objective. And this is the key of the error budget. And finally, the SLA part is we've got an objective we want to meet, and if we don't meet it, there's some economic uh, penalty. And say in a real world, you have an SLA agreement with uh, your vendor, and if they don't provide the thing you ask them to do, you get some money back, I don't know. Um, internal to Google, the answer is, I'm gonna get paged if I don't meet that objective. Because you've built a system that relies on us meeting that objective. So, is it possible there are things in the world that have 100% uh, SLA? I think so. I mean, you don't want only five nines reliability on a pacemaker. But there are other things that don't need that. The phone in your pocket right now how does it get to the internet? And the answer is, it goes all over a lot of things, and how reliable are any of those things? And it turns out, only about five nines reliable across the whole network. So, it's very expensive to try and get to 100% reliability, in fact you can't. It's expensive to add additional nines. As you go more and more nines, the uh, cost increases exponentially. So we don't try to do that. We say, the best we have to be is only as good as all the infrastructure between the user and us. And we can improve that over time. You can build CDNs, you can get access to the uh, devices themselves and help make them better and more responsive and, and uh, do little tricks like caching and so forth to make it look like it's 100% available, but it can't be, and so we can manage that and we can use it to our advantage. So the error budget is one minus the SLO. So that little percentage left over of, it doesn't matter if we don't hit that, we should use it to, uh, instead of just crossing our fingers and hoping it works really well. So I don't really actually want to serve one million errors in a month, but it's okay if I do. So I'm not setting out to do that. I'm not saying the system has to exactly serve 100, uh, sorry, one million errors, but if it does, that's useful to us. So what do you spend your budget on? We spend it on changes. They're the number one cause of outages, but we want them to happen, so we let changes occur, we measure their effects, and we can use that to judge whether or not we should do any more rollouts. So if we're in SLO, go nuts. If we're not, stop. Roll it back, perhaps. Depends on how bad the SLO burn is right now. If we've only spent a little bit, we can go, well, let's have a look and think about what's happening. If we've exceeded the SLO, we should roll it back to something that's known good. The great thing about this is it removes us as gatekeepers of the system, everybody gets to own it, we agree on what the targets are, and then everything just magically happens. The teams themselves start to self-police their error budgets because in a development team, they're not acting as a single entity. Everyone's working on different features, and if that person spends the error budget for the month on their feature, everyone else on the team is gonna be upset that they're not gonna meet their feature milestones. So they're gonna talk to each other, they're gonna be a little bit more careful in reviews, 
they're going to learn best practices sooner and information propagates and everyone starts to work together and, it, and it's super happy. And the third point is we have this idea of testing in production, which is any number of tests you write before going into production is at best a simulation of what you think people are going to do to the system. And there's no better way of figuring out what users are going to do than point users at the product. And so how can we do that? We can spend the error budget. We can roll out a part of the system, the new system, to users and see how they act. If it crashes, great. Uh, it was only a small amount of people affected. If it um, makes them behave differently, great, we've learned something. If it works, even better, we can proceed. And this is the idea behind what we Google called canarying after the canary in the coal mine. Uh, and there's um, a bunch of Medium posts floating around nowadays about the idea behind pushing code out into production and, and managing that process in a way such that you can spend a little bit of error budget and learn a lot about the system. S3 can throw people at badly functioning systems, but we choose not to because we don't think it's a very fun job. And like we said, we don't want to spend people, we don't want to grow the team at the same rate as the system grows. As the system grows, it naturally creates more errors and problems. Tickets show up. The number of tickets growing is a good sign of the um, service growing. But if the people on the team grow to meet the ticket load, that's a bad sign. The problem is, if these tickets don't make their way back to the product development team, they don't know about it. And so they don't fix it. And so if the operations team is handling all of the tickets all the time for everything, and there's no escalation path back to the development team, then they won't ever fix it. Or maybe they just go, hey, look, I don't even want to know about that stuff because I'm still trying to work on my features. And isn't that the whole reason we set up this divide in the first place? But it's just another incentives problem. And everyone who's familiar with the DevOps three ways is going to find a lot of this stuff um, familiar as well. And so we've already talked about how we staff the teams from the same pool. The product uh, management can choose to assign more people to reliability of the product or feature development. If there's more operations work, then necessarily you need to put more SRE people on the team, but you only have a fixed size budget, so, so what do you do? If the uh, load increases so high that the SRE team can't cope, and you add people to it, all the feature development stops, and then all the reliability issues get fixed, and then you go back to feature development, that seems like a good idea. But the idea is that we've got this feedback cycle going on that says if this uh, body of work increases, then we need to start spending time on making that work go away. And this is easy because we hire programmers exactly as we hire product developers. SREs know how computers work. And we're a bit lazy. So we like to automate ourselves out of jobs, which means that tickets that show up regularly get focused and made to go away. So whole classes of problems end up getting um, redesigned so they don't occur anymore. So you can imagine a case where um, you start getting lots of tickets about disk usage filling up. You go, okay, there's way too many of this happening. The system apparently is growing a lot. We need to figure out why it's growing, why, say, automatic GC isn't working, build a capacity plan, get ahead of this stuff for, for future growth. And then once our problem is solved, allegedly, we don't have disk-based problems anymore. We have to leave enough time for the project work to make these tickets go away, so we deliberately put a cap on SRE's time of 50% of their um, working life to well, operational work, so tickets and on-call and so forth. And all the rest of it is project work in which they get to make improvements to the system to make classes of problems go away. So if there are repeated pages and repeated tickets, like I said, then we get to spend the time to fix all that. You can imagine, though, that um, if the amount of work required to get done is greater than what 50% of the SRE team has available, then you might start getting a backlog that starts to grow because no one's actually fixing it. It seems like basic queuing theory. So we make sure that the developers are on call for the product on doing tickets. Because no, uh, like the bullet point says, everyone can agree that a problem is a problem if everyone can see the problem. I know there's a lot of debate about this topic. My personal opinion is it doesn't matter if the devs are not on call as long as there's a mutual respect between the teams and they'll take your problem seriously. If you can talk to your team and say, uh, we need to fix this problem because it's consuming all of our time, and they say, yes, great, we have dumped all our priorities and we're going to work on that first, then that's incredibly healthy. If you don't have that, then it seems like a good idea to just kind of uh, replace a carrot with a bit of a stick and say, 
you're going to go on call for a little while. Once the queue fills up and there's more work than there are people to do it, necessarily the dev team has to start helping out. And so the rules we have are that because the S3s can only ever spend 50% of their time on tickets and on call work, everything that can't get done in that time frame gets handed back to the devs. And so this is another um, feedback cycle that helps manage the amount of feature development causing new potential bugs versus improvements to reliability. And the final thing is that S3s don't have to stick around. They can move teams and they can change job roles because they're software engineers within the company. It's the same job letter. So you can just say, you know what? I'm not happy on this team. I'm going to go look for some other work. Whole SRE teams can also do this. We can say the pager is yours. We've got management backing on this. You have, like, we've tried to come to a resolution here and it's just not working. So here you go. Here's the pager. We're going to go find something else to do. It's rarely executed, but is an incredibly pow powerful incentive to, to help everyone understand why the SRE organization exists. All right, so we'll move on to the third part. It's okay to have an outage. It's, I mean, it's not exciting. I mean, it's a bit exciting. It feels a bit bad. But we know that they're going to happen because we've said they're allowed to happen. So let's figure out how we're going to manage that. And the two goals for every outage is obviously making it not last for very long and then figuring out why it happened and making that go away so it never happens again. So we want to detect our outages very quickly, which means that the team responsible for the product gets paged directly. There's no um, knock handling uh, routing issues or doing like first level troubleshooting. And we have lots of diagnostic information in the alert itself, links to dashboards, uh, lots of help documentation and so on and so forth. So people can quickly page in how the system is supposed to work, look at the signals that describe the problem that they've been alerted for and try and make um, rational decisions about why something might be happening. Um, you might have heard the word observability thrown around a lot uh, in the last couple of years. We try very hard to make the systems observable so we can understand why they're, ask questions about them and understand why they're doing particular things. So we're talking uh, distributed tracing, logs, and metrics. And the last thing is the best way to remediate anything is to have done it before because then you know how to do it. So we practice a lot. We run drills. We run uh, semi-annual disaster recovery tests across the whole company. And we run this fun thing uh, regularly within our own little teams called the Wheel of Misfortune, which is being on call simulation. So what you do is you, um, who plays Dungeons and Dragons? Good, nobody? Oh, sorry, sorry. Roll your dice, pick a scenario. The uh, game master runs the team through the scenario. Somebody is designated to be on call and they have to do all the things. So uh, the, other, the pager goes off. What's the first thing you do? You have to act the page so that people know that you've got it. It doesn't get escalated to the secondary. It's always a fun one for new people because five minutes later, the uh, game master can say, secondary, you've just got paged. And they're like, oh, I didn't act the page. People take this very seriously. So once the event has been handled, we write the postmortem, the post-incident review process happens. We analyze what happened. We get all the facts together. We build a timeline of events. We try and understand why people made the decisions they did. And then we go and write a bunch of action items and, and fix them all. We have this rule that we're only allowed to have about two, like we try and achieve a, of only about two events per shift, which means you get paged on average every six hours, which is kind of setting what our um, a minimum mean time to failure can be. And that's going to inform what our SLOs can be because we don't want to page people too often because it means that they won't be able to respond within that on average six hour window to understand why problems happened. So if you get paged too often, you're not going to have enough time to really drill into any problem. If you get paged too much, maybe we're not finding the right balance between uh, too much automation and engineering time and, and people actually still like, get paid to do this. So I know there's a lot of contention about what the, uh, whether you should try and really achieve two events per shift. I don't think you should. I like sleeping. But it also means that there's a minimum group size for any team. And we have eight people in a single site in an SRE team, which means that uh, it's at least six weeks between on-call shifts, which means you have plenty of time to uh, do your project work, time to go on vacation. And if you're a two-site team, say Sydney and Mountain View, like a lot of my teams are, then often it's six people minimum on both sides, so 12 people overall, and you're sharing 12-hour shift splits. 
And when we're writing the postmortem, I think this is, will be very familiar to all of you. There's no blame assigned. It's trying to understand cognitive models. We all understand our biases. We want to focus on the technology and the information available at the time and the processes involved and fix them so these mistakes don't happen again. Reliability is the number one feature of any product online. There's no way you can get out of that. It does mean you have to assign people to work on that, otherwise it'll just naturally atrophy as people decide that features are more important. You wanna hire people and give them agency over the system and give them the, the uh, responsibility and authority to fight for reliability of the system. And I think that's the key strength of what SRE does is we have senior management backing to make all kinds of decisions that upset people sometimes, but we can come to them with data and uh, try and find compromises. But ultimately we say the reason we're doing this is because we want your product to succeed. We don't want it to fail and be an embarrassing front page news story. And then we have a bunch of ways in which we can achieve that. Measurement, using things that we know are gonna happen to our advantage, like error budgets. And then we build in a bunch of feedback loops to try and help the system um, self-sustain. So shared hiring pools, shared operations work. We practice a lot and no, post moments, okay. So you can read more about it in the uh, O'Reilly book, uh, landing.google.com slash SRE slash book.html. If you don't wanna get a paper copy, you can go read the whole thing online right now. And we have a website for the organization ourselves with more information, probably a better explanation of anything that I've just said. Uh, videos, some of my colleagues are making a bunch of videos now, uh, they're very exciting things. And with that, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, David. So as I, um, as I said before, we're gonna use the slide or do um, to, to post some questions. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll put up the, the event code uh, so that you can type your questions in. How do I embed the SRE process into a legacy system? Uh, do you mean like a traditional enterprise org? Yeah. Uh, do you mean like so a traditional a enterprise org? Yeah. Um, that is a really good question and I don't have any personal experience with that. <laughs> I've got some vague advice, which is you could approach it from, you've, it's gonna be a long game you're gonna have the goal set out, you're gonna to have to have somebody who champions the whole process and can see what the vision is gonna be, but you're gonna be making very small incremental change and in showing value added to the company with each small step. And I think it's basically the same as a DevOps transformation for any company. You're gonna be showing the business that there's value to be had in this, this change. And it's gonna to be totally hard because people don't like change and cultural uh, changes are much, much harder than technical changes. But good luck. So we've got the slido.com. Um, yeah, if you guys have any more questions, uh, just go to the slido.com. Uh, that's the code that you should use for the event, and then you can just uh, post the questions there, and we'll try to get them up on the screen. Um, if you have any other questions, just yell out, and I'll, I'll, I'll run to you with the microphone. Hi. Um, in many organizations, uh, there is a limited access policy to developers. How do you then manage um, to share the operational workload with the developers in that case? Does limited access policy mean like they're deliberately siloed from the rest of the company, no one should talk to them because they're doing very important work? Mostly the physical siloing where devs don't have direct access to production. Oh, I see, or... they can't, right, right. Um, there's, unless you change the policy, there's gonna be a bunch of work that they can't do. But can they get read-only read access to debugging information and help figure out and triage problems and then make recommendations? Yes, they can. Great. Thank you. I think we've got, we've got a few more questions. Uh, with SRE, what are the changes to behavior with teams monitoring prod? Um, I did, sorry, I don't really understand. Everything we are monitoring in production. So, like, that's the first behavior? Sorry, I'm gonna try and think about that a little bit more. We, we, mon we try and monitor everything we're writing alerts based on the SLOs we set up. Um, so that informs us how we're gonna figure out which parts of the system that we care about in order to alert on. Uh, but we're also creating dashboards with like backend statistics. So basically every API interface 
We're going to export some metrics about how the client and the server side are interacting and expose that so we can see is it a client problem, is it a server problem, uh, are they confused about what's going on, maybe it's a network problem in between. Um, so we use that. Um, we export a lot of metrics and put them on little strip charts and, and use that to drill down and look around and see what's going on in the system. Uh, but the alerts themselves are basically what the SLOs are defined to be. And that way we only have a page on stuff that we think is going to affect users. And then that starts the um, debugging process. Uh, I guess coming from teams that think they should alert on everything, like, oh, the storage backend is gone, so I should page on that. Um, telling people not to do that often makes them feel uncomfortable because they know that the system is not working properly when the back end is down. They're like, no, you've got to think about it differently. Like, how many users are actually affected by that? Um, what tools do we use for automation and monitoring? So many things. Uh, Google has a long history of not invented here. Some of it is because Google was first and so had to build it out of necessity. And some of it is just because, oh, hey, we've got like millions of engineers, so we can just like throw them at the problem. And, and uh, now with the cloud platform, we are adopting lots of open source technology, and that's really cool. And I'm super excited about that. Um, the one thing I regret when I came into Google was I, a few years later, suddenly I was gone from the open source ecosystem. I didn't know what was going on anymore. So I'm very excited about Google Cloud. It means I can start thinking about it again. Um, monitoring, we used to use a thing that looks like Prometheus called Borgmon. Um, and now we've moved to a new system called Monarch, which is like a centrally uh, managed system where we just throw metrics into it and tell it, hey, plot the thing for me. And so it takes a lot of the maintenance of the monitoring system away from individual teams and puts it into a single team. And that uh, scales better for the organization. It means there are a few people overall caring about monitoring, how the monitoring system works, and everybody becomes a customer of that. But uh, for the longest time, everybody ran their own monitoring, and it made people really happy because somebody else's outage didn't affect them, and they could still see what their own monitoring system was telling them about their system. And so there's a trade-off to be had between how much control do you want over the system that you care about versus uh, how much does it cost everybody if everybody's running the same um, stack. Uh, okay, if all site failures are handled by the SREs, how do you determine if it's security related and how do we interface with security? Oh, that's a great question. We have um, systems at the front end that can figure out if um, denial of service attacks are going on and that gets handed by an incident response team. The, the security organization looks a little bit like SRE in that they're doing security operations, and they have on-call rotations and they build software to try and manage security incidents and so forth. So there's a lot of parallels. Um, how do we interface with them? We call them up and say, hey, we're having a problem, or this looks kind of suspicious, or they tell us, hey, did you know you're being dosed? I'm like, nope, sorry, that's cool. Um, I think the generic answer to that question is we figure it out while we're debugging it. Like if there's a capacity outage or like the load has suddenly increased on a service and we're like, that's very weird. We haven't changed anything. And normally it's changing things that causes problems like that. We'll go back and see, oh, there's actually traffic. We can see that uh, there's a lot of traffic coming from a particular uh, AS or a country or something like that and go, that's very suspicious. I wonder if we're being DOS, then we can go back and trace it through and ask people the right questions. Um, everyone, all the different teams at Google are very receptive to other people asking them questions because everyone's a little specialist. And so if you have a problem with a system that you don't understand, you can go talk to their on caller and say, I think this weird thing is happening. And they'll be like, oh yeah, let me, uh, let me show you some charts or point you to some documentation and, and help you out with that. Um, do I have a definition of uh, error is within the error budget? Um, no, you get to make that up when you write what the, um, the SLI is. But let's say I'm doing web serving and I choose to say everything that is in the 500 series error code, that's an error. The 404 errors, maybe that's legitimate, I'm not sure yet. 200s are definitely not errors. Uh, so you gotta figure out what that means. Um, let's say you say 404s are uh, definitely errors because I know that I'm serving static content that I manage and if people are poking the 404s, then that's like something that shouldn't be happening. And so it's very easy then to say, this whole thing are errors, this whole thing are not errors, and I can just take the ratio of that over time. Uh, if you're doing something different, like I'm running a storage system and I care mostly about the time to first byte, and the time to first byte falls out of a, a millisecond threshold, then do you want that to be an error? That's totally up to you. But maybe you have multiple SLIs. One of them is what's the latency curve look like and how many of those are exceeding a deadline. 
and then you can have, say, maybe 95% of them should always be under 200 milliseconds. We also have a deadline at 300 milliseconds that says guarantee that's an error because like, the user's already given up. I was once um, an engineer on the back end for cloud storage and I was working on caching technology to save a bunch of dollars over transoceanic trans links and I introduced a bug and the photos team noticed it because somehow it accidentally, like I, we, I'd introduced a bug so I rolled back which created a second bug where I was um, double wrapping protobufs in the cache content and we had no way of figuring out that that had happened in the previous version of the code. And so we were sending back invalid data upstream. And the photos people were like, suddenly all our thumbnails don't look like JPEGs anymore. And we're like, oh crap. And I flipped a flag globally across the fleet. I think of like 7,000 tasks around the planet in about five minutes and dumped a very large number of cache bytes that was saving a very large number of dollars in, in a short space of time. And that was very exciting. And I still have a job, so I'm happy about that. Can SREs contribute to whether a system can be scaled out or not? Can you say, can I? Um, yes, absolutely. Like that is one of our jobs, is to do uh, design review early in order to prevent reliability issues later on where it's like, oh, we're being paged and there's people have deployed that system in that way that we know totally doesn't work. We should go early on into the design phase and say, I'm reading your design and you've chosen a pattern that we know is gonna cause some problems. And it, maybe it's fine right now, but as soon as you add like this amount of load, then the latency is gonna behave like this. And maybe you're gonna have consistency problems. Or uh, We try to, we ask people to come to us early so we can talk to them about ideas. It doesn't always happen. But when a team, a product team has an SRE team already, that relationship is good because they know that they can talk to each other. They know who to talk to. If, an SRE, if a development team does not have a uh, close relationship with an SRE team, then they go, oh, maybe I'll try and learn about it myself or try and find a friendly SRE who I know from the office that I can ask questions to. Um, there's a team that I work on now which is trying to build all of this stuff automatically so engineers just get reliable choices without having to think too hard about it. Um, so we're doing capacity planning in Sydney. There are other teams that are building um, automatic load control systems. So if your system goes into an overload situation, automatically the libraries take care of that stuff for you. Um, but it's a good question because how do you share that knowledge around? People learn things from experience. We have to write them down. We have to tell people about them. So we run like classes and uh, so we run an educational class for all SREs when they join the company. We also run regular, excuse me, reliability classes for the product developers um, in every office or we can fly them back to the the head office and say, take the training, it's about two weeks long and you're gonna learn everything and it's gonna be super amazing. Um, okay. Uh, what are the day-to-day -day tasks? Yeah, code review, absolutely. I write code, I try to write code. Um, I end up writing a lot of monitoring code. I'm, my background is as a sysadmin and not a programmer. Um, so I end up writing lots of like blue code, equivalent of puppet stuff. Prometheus configuration, um, stuff that helps the jobs run in reliable configurations and automation around that stuff. But my colleagues are writing lots of C++ because they're trying to make the systems themselves behave reliably. Oh, I see we're out of time. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>